That's all they want to. They just have been sold this lie. You can't show your heart. This is business. You got to be a little detached. I'm like, why? People want to know you care. What is it? Maya Angelou, you know that poem she wrote, that, that, that line? People will forget what you said to them. People will forget what you did for them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Make people feel good. This That's your is job. Unconditioning. Discovering the Voice Within with Whitney Ann Jenkins. Hello and welcome to the 60th episode of Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, where I bring on guests and we talk about the inner authentic voice and the challenges and the rewards that come from following it. This week I have with me Nikki Ballou. He is the number one international best-selling author of the book Finish Line Thinking, How to Think and Win Like a Champion, The Thought Leader's Journey, A Fable of Life, and The Power of Connecting how to activate profitable relationships by serving your network. He's an in-demand and highly inspirational speaker to corporate audiences, such as RBC and Lululemon. And he is an advisor and confidant to some of the most successful and dynamic entrepreneurs in Canada. He's the founder of eCircle Academy, where he runs a year-long mastermind and educational program working with coaches, consultants, corporate trainers, clinic owners, realtors, mortgage brokers, and other service-based entrepreneurs, positioning them as authorities in their niche. He is the creator of the Thought Leader Heart Leader designation. As the host of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution, Nikki has interviewed over 300 of the world's top thought leaders such as astronaut Chris Hadfield, Kathy Ireland, and Jack Canfield. I talked with Nikki about his Iranian background and his story of how he got to the place in order to be able to lead others and to coach them to their thought leader success. So without any further explanation from me, here is Nikki Ballou. Okay, I'm ready to roll. Okay, excellent. You are helping others to find their own authentic voice as thought leaders or entrepreneurs. And in order to be able to do that, you had to experience a lot of things yourself in order to be able to be a guide for that. So one of the first things that I like to ask my guests on my podcast is, when was the first time that you realized that you had an inner voice of your own that was guiding you. Um, and it was something that was purely your own and something that you were able to follow. That's a great question. It has nothing to do with business. But um, when I was 21 years old, uh, I was a while ago, back in 1989, January 89, my, um, one of my two brothers, the middle brother, I'm the eldest, he... Um, he was in the hospital with a burst of appendix and he was having it removed, right? So he wanted to attend a course. And remember, this is the days before internet, never mind social media, right? And this course, I couldn't sign up online. I had to go there in person to sign up. They had an event at a hotel uh, in Toronto where I live on, a, on, a, on an iconic street called Bloor Street in Toronto, Bloor near Young. There was a hotel there. Um, and that hotel I don't think exists anymore, but at the time it was a um, you know an iconic hotel on an iconic street, you know really cool, high end part of Toronto. And I walked into that room, and um, and they said, "Hey," and they said, "Hey, welcome, sign in." And I said, "No, no, I'm not here to sign. I'm actually here just to sign someone up. I want to sign them up, and then I'm going to go." They said, "Actually, we're not doing that right now." we're, you know, we're doing a bit of a presentation first. We're not set up to sign you up. So you have a choice. You can go and come back or you can stay for the presentation. And, you know, I didn't want to go and come back. I had nothing to do. So all right, I'll stay for the presentation. And um, the, there was a couple that was leading the presentation. The wife was pregnant with uh, um, her uh, second child, which was a boy. Uh, his name's William, you know, he's, he's now over 30 years old, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and there was a husband and she met me and she, she asked me my name because I had a name tag on and Nikki Ballou and they, they came up and they brought a lot of energy and positivity into the room. And 
one of the first things she she did was uh, they showed us how using what they taught, um, you could enhance your memory. So she, there were a couple hundred people in the room, like no joke, right? She remembered everyone's name with the correct pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Every person's name. And I'd never been into any course like this before, but I didn't just sign my brother up, I signed myself up. And that was the beginning of my personal development journey at the age of 21. Wow. Okay. So when you were growing up, were you encouraged by your family to follow your own passions or your own dreams? Or did they have a very specific trajectory or expectations of oh, you? Oh, man, I, I'm, I'm an Iranian <laughs> uh, yes. eldest son. My mom wanted me to be a doctor. My dad was a little bit more laissez-faire and encouraged me, but he, he was encouraged me to go in a business direction. And I was inclined to go in a business direction. But, you know, in our family growing up, we were definitely told there are some correct places to put our dreams and passions and ambitions and hopes into. And there were some incorrect places. Uh, and I spent more time with my mom because dad, you know, ran a business and he worked. and mom worked too but not as much as dad you know so um that was kind of where we were at but uh when i was in my early 20s um that was a time where my parents uh you know especially my mom just became a little bit more open to us figuring out our own path and when i did this program this was a um meditation and visualization and manifestation program called the silva method it's still around it's been around since the late 1960s they they really both of them encouraged us to just figure it out for ourselves yeah okay so from that moment which seemed to have a pretty profound impact on you uh, and your personal journey uh, what happened next well um I ended up going to do my master's at Georgetown University, in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, me going to do that kind of was the expected thing. I mean, I wanted to do it, but like a bunch of my friends were doing it. And it wasn't that I'd thought it through all that well. You, you know what I mean? Um, but it was a great experience. I, I did really well. I graduated magna cum laude. And then when I graduated in 1991, there was a recession, a major recession, North America, well, actually globally, but North America, well, it was pretty hard. Companies weren't hiring the way they had been. So I didn't actually get a, I didn't actually get an immediate job. It took me about a year and a half to land a corporate job. I just kind of wandered around, meandered for a year and a half, trying to figure it out. Then I got a corporate job with a, a telecom company that, the market had become deregulated. There was competition for the first time in the telecom long distance space. So I, I, I worked there from 93 to 97. Uh, and I had a variety of positions. First, I was um, in a group called Carrier Relations, where we basically set up relationships with other carriers in other countries to exchange minutes. So their calls would be terminated on our network and ours would be terminated on theirs. Then I got into finance. I was there for about a year and a bit. And then after that, I, I entered a sales support role. And that was not good. That's when I got introduced to the world of uh, corporate politics. Mm. And um, yeah, didn't get on with some of the people. And I found my way out of that company. I got myself another job. I pushed back hard against my bosses because they were, frankly, treating me poorly. And uh, I, that bought me enough time to be able to get another job. So then I went to what was my favorite corporate job, which was working for a year at a, um, at a cell phone company called ClearNet PCS. And um, that was fun. I was in a, uh, um, you know, an opening up uh, channels, channel partnership role with the universities. I opened up a bunch of channels with them and I had a blast, I had a great boss. And then she left, um, I had another boss. He was good, he wasn't as good as her, but he was still pretty good. And after that, an entrepreneurial opportunity to go work with my father. So for about a, a year, I, I, I went back to the Middle East in oh, Dubai. Wow. Um, 
and uh, my father um, equipped hospitals. So I was working with a partner of his there, but just the timing was was bad again. You know, the price <laughs> of oil tanked, so like, Iran wasn't buying anything. You know, they weren't buying, they weren't equipping their hospitals. So that didn't work out. I came back to Canada, got back into telecom, and then I got into an internet company uh, that the telecom company had bought. I was in a sales role in both. I hated it at first, but near the end, I, I managed to score the biggest deal in the history of the company. It was a half a million dollar deal. I became the hero of the company. And then I, I quit and I went to another job, another sales role, more money, uh, IT security. I got promoted there. So even more money. And then um, that company went bankrupt in 2001 because it was the dot com. So, you know, I was lost again for a while. I went back to the internet company for just a few months, but it didn't really want to be there. And it was obvious. So I, I left. And then I had another personal development epiphany. I, I was doing some personal development programs at an organization called Landmark. Mark Worldwide, they're called now. Back then they were called Landmark Education. And that was really helping me grow and understand myself more. And um, I signed up to do a program called the Introduction Lead Program. And I got into that program last minute, just like that. And then from there, um, I had to go to Philadelphia to, um, to do the first weekend. It wasn't in Toronto. So I came to your, your, your home state, right? <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I met the woman who would then end up becoming my wife. We met there. We instantly connected. Uh, you know, I asked her out on a date. She wanted me to ask her out on a date. You know, we walked together a couple of times. We, we shared a couple of passionate kisses and um, within a, a week, we were a couple. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, within five months, we were married. Um, there was just a lot of possibility and intensity and energy around all that. Yeah. Uh, and um, anyways, long and the short of that was, that was, that was great. I, got into the world of being my own boss. I, I, I was a, um, became a uh, fitness entrepreneur. I started a program with a couple of Olympic champions called Transform. And we did well for a while, but it was partner issues. And mm -hmm. that company broke up within a, a couple of years. I stayed friends with one of the champions. You know, we've done a few things together. Um, but, I, but I stayed a trainer for about 10 years. And then my then wife, you know, seemingly out of the blue, partway through that, decided she didn't want to be married to me. And, and I maybe I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. Um, I went into a dark spiral, dark, dark spiral. I blamed everybody but myself for this. And I was in another personal development program. And there was a man in there who, to this day, I can't stand. But on that day, he did me a, a huge service. Uh, he was just needling me and i got up to punch him he just got under my skin so much five of the other men grabbed me so i wouldn't punch him and then he said to me when are you going to stop blaming your wife when are you going to stop blaming yourself when are you going to take responsibility for the mess you've made of your life and the truth of that statement slash question hit me in the deepest recess of my soul yeah I collapsed in the arms of these five men. I started to cry. And um, I, I, I owned it in that moment. I, I forgave her. I forgave myself. I took responsibility. Our phones were handed in and turned off. So when I got my phone back, um, I turned it on instantly. She called me and she said, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been trying to make you suffer. I'm done with that now. And let's, uh, you know, let, I'll sign the divorce papers because she wasn't signing them even though she didn't want the divorce. It was really funny. <laughs> but then she signed them and everything, you know, went through. And uh, during this process, I met the woman right now. That's that's my lady love. And we've been together almost 12 years. Um, I've got a great relationship with the ex. I've got, a, you know, two beautiful teenage sons. They're growing up into great men. They're not being raised as pussies. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> As a lot of boys, unfortunately, are. We're living in a time where, you know, boyhood, manhood, and masculinity are being crapped upon. Um, right. It's it's unreal uh, what people are saying 
to boys and doing to boys. So, um, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, um, that's what it was. That's, that's, that's kind of what got me to the next stage. I've continued to do personal development programs right. and coaching throughout this process. I believe I'm a product of my own product because that's the work I do for entrepreneurs is I help them with that, but I'm a product of my own product. And it, it's through continuing to do this work that I've become better and I've become more successful. And I'm, I'm 55 years old right now. Uh, you know, it's my desire to spend the next 20 years continuing to grow yeah. as, a, as, a, as a man and as a as a businessman so that yeah. I can you know be the best version of myself and myself and my family uh, and also be of service to the people that come to me because one thing I've figured out that I'm really good at is I'm really good at standing for other people like I'm a, you know I'm loyal to people I, I help them win and I'm good at getting other people paid you know yeah. over the last however many years I've worked with, uh, you know, 160, 170 people, about 80 plus of them. We've helped add anywhere from six to eight figures to their annual income. Wow. That's pretty good. That's a great yeah. track record. <laughs> I think so. Definitely. I want to take a moment um, to acknowledge like all of the things that you went through to get to where you are now. Um, and you went through a lot of changes within many different companies it seems and you had to make like very specific decisions for yourself in order to get to the next step so what was it that was like guiding you to make these decisions what what were you following so I'm a product of my environment in many ways right my my father was an entrepreneur like when I was 11 years old the Islamic revolution happened in Iran right and um we're Christians so my dad took a look at what was going on. He said, this is not going to be a good place to raise a Christian family. So he made a plan and he got us out of Iran and eventually we settled in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where I live now. And I thank God for dad having the foresight to do that, right? He took us out of tyranny and brought us to freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Whitney, I don't know if you follow the international news. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen what's happening in Iran. You heard the story of that young woman, Masa Amini, who was beaten to death for not covering her hair. You have beautiful, long, blonde hair. In Iran, you would have to cover all of that. You'd have to, like, tighten it up, put it there. You could not show anything but your face in Iran. Your entire body would be covered. Like, you know how you've got a bit of a neckline here. You couldn't have that in Iran. You'd have to be, like, up to where I am now, and you'd have to have, like, something covering you up, covering up your, you know, your hands and your face. That's all you can show. That's the law. If you're yeah. a woman. I mean, you think about that, and, you know, there's people here in the West that say dumb things like, we're so oppressed here. This is so racist. It's so sexist. Are you out of your mind? This is the greatest, freest place that ever was and probably ever will be. You know, <laughs> you want to know oppression? Come to Iran. I'll show you. I'll help you. I'll help you understand real oppression. Okay. Because you obviously have no clue what it is. <laughs> right. And, and, and my dad was, um, was an entrepreneur. He was an uplifter of people. I wanted to be like him. If you knew him and you were looking for a job, he would help you find a job, Whitney. If you were looking to start a business, he would help you start that business. Now, get this. He helped some people start business who were competing with him. <laughs> he didn't care. He just said, I want you to succeed. Go out there and do your thing. Yeah, you'll compete with me. It's all good. You know, you're not my enemy. We're still friends. Go, go, go be successful. There's plenty of business out there. That attitude was brilliant, right? Yeah. If you worked for him, let's say you wanted to buy a car, a house, or an apartment, and you didn't have enough money. If he found out, he would go and top you up so you could buy that car, that house, that apartment. And you think about what kind of man that is, you know, what kind of human that is, right? Yeah. Like, that's like, I wanted to be like that. I just like Napoleon Ballou, that was my dad's name, cool name, right? Yeah. Napoleon Ballou was the greatest man I've ever known, ever will know, you know? And I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to help people. I got into the entrepreneurship eventually because of that example from when I was a boy. 
and here's what I saw, right? Most entrepreneurs that get into the helping professions, you know, like the helping entrepreneur real journey, like coaching, consulting, right? Yeah. real estate, mortgage, you know, like serving people. Mm -hmm. They're good at what they do. They're not good at business. Right. You understand what I'm saying? I, I, good I at do. What they do. <laughs> I, I do They're understand. Not yeah. good at business. Mm -hmm. They don't understand marketing and sales. They don't understand finance and payroll and cash flow and bookkeeping. They don't understand hiring and firing, branding. They don't understand this. And that hurts them. They don't get to grow and serve the way they ought to. So, and one of the key things that they really don't get is marketing and sales. So on the sales front, they don't want to come across as pushy or salesy. They don't understand that, you know, you have to have sales. You have to come across as, as somebody who is going to help. And for me, I've never looked at sales that way. I've always looked at sales as love. I'm going to sell to you if I feel some love for you. You know what I mean? And I, I'm moved by your plight enough to want to help you. Then I'll sell to you. I'm not selling to you to get your money. I'm selling to you to help you win. And yeah, I should get paid for doing that. That's business. That's life. But that's my attitude. So I thought, okay, let's help folks reframe selling to what it really is, which is love. So I reframe selling to serving. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't want to be sold. You don't like a pushy salesperson. Going, oh, come on, buy, 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 buy. I don't want to be sold. I don't like that either. But I bet you, you love to buy. You look, Whitney, like you love to buy. You love certain things. You love buying them. You're like into having them. Just like me, there's things you like that just, but you're, you're going to buy it on your good terms, right? You want somebody, if they're going to help you, somebody who's like trying to help you make the best decision because they have some expertise, right? So me, um, I collect exotic things. Like this looks like a bullet, right? It's a pen. It's a pen. Um, it sits on my desk, right? I love it. I love looking at it. I don't use it very often. I use it sometimes because I have other pens that I use, but I just love looking at it. Like, I mean, I'm not even using it, right? But I love looking <laughs> at it. I bought it. Why did I buy it? Because I love to buy things like that. I collect, look at my bookshelves. I have read over 4,000 books I buy a couple hundred books a year. My book collection grows faster than I can read. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you reframe selling to serve, the attention is off of you, which is part of the problem for entrepreneurs. They put all the attention on them. Are they going to like me? Are they going to want to buy from me? Blah, 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 blah. And the attention is on the person in front of you. My dad used to say, business and life are not about money, son. No, they're about people that's someone's daughter that's someone's sister that's someone's wife that's someone's son someone's brother someone's husband they're a hero to somebody yeah they're they've been through life with hopes and dreams and disappointments and maybe even someone like you promised them everything and delivered nothing to them and disappointed them and shook their faith in people. And as a result of that, right, as a result of that, you know, they need someone who really cares to come forward. So for me, that was the first thing that 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 desire to be like dad mm -hmm. and to be of service really has been kind of reverberating throughout my life yeah and it seems to have served you well to serve others yeah it has yeah so I I kind of want to touch upon this thing that we were talking about earlier about men and the current narrative that is going on around that and give you an opportunity to share your perspective on that and sure. maybe Absolutely. like dive in a little deeper about that because there does seem to be a certain attack on men in general during this time well, yes there was an attack on men i think that look there's a book that i recommend everybody read 
It's called Willing Accomplices by Kent Clisby. He's a former CIA case officer. And in it, he lays out the case for how um, the worldwide communist movement has been working to subvert the West and, and freedom for over a century. So back in 1917, um, communists overthrew the czar and Russia became the first communist nation in the history of the world, right? And Vladimir Lenin, he believed in the in the um, goal of worldwide Marxist revolution, right? And he he was committed to it, but he realized that for that to happen, um, he needed to defeat the adversaries of communism. One of the main adversaries of communism, the main adversary, according to him, was the United States. He called it the main adversary. So. He understood that America could only be defeated from within, not from without. It was too strong to be attacked in a war. They would they would defeat, you know, mm. any nation. So he sent a um, a German Marxist by the name of Willy Munzenberg into the United States to start destabilizing the country by recruiting people to destabilize schools, destabilize um, uh, academia. Uh, the media and destabilize storytelling, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. It took a period of decades, but they've been successful. Because if you go and you look at textbooks from 100 years ago, they're patriotic, pro-American. You read newspaper accounts for patriotic, pro-American, and movies until kind of the 90s were patriotic, pro-American. But they started the, the seeping in of this rot, anti-American rot happened starting in the, you know, subtly in the 70s. But by the 2010s, it was overt, right? And there's a man named Yuri Berezov, and uh, he he um, there's a long um, video on YouTube which you can watch, where he talks about how the KGB came to infiltrate America and Western countries and turn them against themselves, and they're going after the school children to turn the the, the kids of America against it. And one of the things that they knew they had to do was to weaken men because you know men wouldn't put up with this. So if you weaken men, you weaken the family. Um, that's that. In the last in 2020, when the the you know the lockdowns came in response to COVID, yeah, they were testing to see who was going to stand up, and some people did, um, but they crushed them hard. Like in Canada, where I am, the truckers were crushed hard mm -hmm. for standing up for their rights. Um, and these, this was deliberate because they don't want anybody standing up for their rights. You, you know, um, you uh, you got to understand that that's what's happening. This is a this is a, a global effort. It's um, it's not happening by accident. And unfortunately, the assault on men has now become an assault on women as well. Like if yeah. you look at this whole transgender movement, like. I have a lot of sympathy for someone going through gen genuine gender dysphoria. I know some people close to me who've gone through it. It's horrible. It's mentally debilitating. Um, it caused one individual to kill himself, right? Kill himself mm -hmm. after transitioning. Um, it, it, it's, it's messed up. But right now, it appears that there's some ideologues that are attempting to confuse little kids Little kids shouldn't be thinking about their sexual or gender identity. It's it's ridiculous. It's 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 a question. I think that you know your your biology determines that. And then when you're older, if you're something strikes you that you want to do something about this, good. But not not children. Children don't should not be shouldn't be allowed uh, anything like that. And this is to destroy manhood. This is an assault on men, and it's an assault on women. Right now, young girls are in sports, and they're competing against men who are saying oh well look i came in 72nd competing in men let me go say i'm a woman so i i win a trophy that's somebody who's messed up who wants attention that's not somebody who's genuinely a girl no that, that's not someone with gender dysphoria that's somebody who's like oh my god you know what i i want to win and i can beat these girls that's and that should that's disgusting and should not be allowed in my opinion it's very interesting. So there also seems to be the narrative of like the patriarchy 
being in control of everything for so long when I don't think you chose to be a part of that. <laughs> so you were just a part of the society that you were born into. So it's not your fault as a man for being a part of what you were born into. Well, you know, I, I want to address that because again, I think that's part of, you know, the narrative of the folks who want to destroy the family and take men down. I'm from Iran, okay? We're a traditional society. I'm sure you can appreciate what I mean by traditional society, right? Yeah. My dad was a big, bluff, intelligent, strong, masculine man. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Nobody would mistake this guy for a snowflake. Into his 60s, you pissed him off, he'd punch you out. Like that's old school type of energy he had. You think he was the boss in our family? Do you really think my dad was the boss in our family? Because I'll set you straight if you do. He was not. He was the mule. He worked his ass off. He made money and he did whatever my mom told him to do. Yeah. And that is the case all over the world. This is an absolute lie that there's a patriarchy. When it made men feel like they're in charge because it makes them easier to manipulate and control. <laughs> Let's just be honest. <laughs> That's a fact. Okay. In the early um, 20th century, Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of the United States, had a stroke, right? Basically, he, he couldn't, he was unintelligible. You understand what I'm saying? You know who ran the country? His wife, Edith. Like, she, all access to the president went through her, right? Cabinet members would, she'd say, he's too busy to talk to you, but he, this is what he told me to tell you. And she did it all. <laughs> And, you know, it was an open secret around the country that, that was the case, right? And there's been this thing that people have said around behind every strong man as a strong woman. It's not just a stain. It's an actual truth. Men, um, men are good at certain things, but without women, we would be, there would be no civilization. There'd be no society. You know why? We would kill each other in 24 hours. Yeah. You, like you put there, there's been social experiments of this that have been done you put a group of men you take all society away from them there's going to be two or three sociopathic personalities that are going to try to run the group if you're lucky there'll be one strong personality who's not sociopathic who'll try to defeat those people and if that fellow doesn't succeed those three will make sure that most of the people are killed or dead within because that's how they are there's a predatory instinct in men by nature and there's a civilizing and nurturing instinct in women but there's also a very women are much more subtle than men they're much more canny as to what's what's required in order to have things work right like my my mom like in public no dad was right and she was like you know deferential and all that at the house you'd go okay this is what we're gonna do <laughs> and he was like okay um you know why i'm here I, i'm here in canada because my mom told my dad we gotta leave iran he made it all happen because that was what he was good at but she says we gotta leave iran this this, this i don't want the kids here and then the second thing that happened was um she said i don't want to move to the states i want to move to canada that would, that would just the dad had relatives in America. Mm -hmm. Mom decided we're going to Canada. Guess where we went? Canada. <laughs> um, I want to buy a house in this neighborhood. Go get us a house in this neighborhood. The kids are going to this school. We're going on vacation here. You know, um, take Nikki and get him a job in your company. And then dad goes, I don't want him working for me. I don't care. He's working for you. <laughs> Yeah, so allowing ourselves to be aligned with our strengths in our authenticity is something that seems to be what we're discussing right now. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know, my, my, uh, my belief right now is a lot of people are scared. You know what I mean? Yeah, the last almost three years have been hard on people. The lockdowns are hard on people. I've got quite a few people who've I know who've killed themselves because of the mental health issues around that. Like, no joke, being isolated is not been good for people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not being good people. And 
one of the reasons I come on shows is because I want to, I want to give people hope. I want them to believe everything great is possible for you. You know what I mean? You don't need to um, wonder whether you're going to survive this time. You're going to thrive in this time, but you got to believe. And if you don't have belief, then borrow my belief for yourself so that you can go out there and win. Yeah. You know, a few years ago, there was a woman who was introduced to us. I, I work with, with my lady, Teresa. And um, this woman was an amazing coach, but again, not a good business woman. You know what I mean? And she was following the all the wrong gurus. She spent $125,000 on gurus and programs and mm. marketing, zero return. And I mean, zero. Her husband said, honey, we don't have 125000 to spend. You got to stop. <laughs> Come on. Like, we're going to go bankrupt. And she was so upset, like, because she's really good at what she did. And she she said, she said to him, okay, honey, I'll, I'll stop. But um, she was like crying. And he just said, okay, go, go back. Find, find a way. <laughs> I can't have an upset wife in the house. <laughs> find a way. And so she was introduced to us. And. I did a deep review of everything she was doing and all the stuff she was doing was not to help her. It was to line the pockets of these asshole gurus, excuse my French, right? Yeah. They were just, Oh, taking advantage of a person's dream. So I said, you gotta stop all this. Just cut it out. She goes, okay. I said, she says, what do I need to do? I said, look, first thing you got to do is we, we got to find out how to differentiate you. What makes you special? And we helped her figure that out. Right. So she, she wasn't just going I'm a whatever. She was like, I help you do this. And what she was helping people do was um, she was helping them like recover relationships that were like dead. Like a husband and wife, they were about to divorce. Her specialty was she turned it around. She was really good at it, eh? Like when all other options had been exhausted, she was your go-to gal. And anyways, we got the message and then she says, well, how do I go get them? Should I spend all this money on Google ads and Facebook and build a new website? I go, no. How many people do you know right now in your personal sphere who are having marital trouble? She goes, well, I can think of a half a dozen. I said, go call all of them. Mm -hmm. said, call them? She was like freaking out. I, you mean I got to pick up a phone? Yeah. And she says, well, what do I tell them? She said, I hear you're having marital trouble. Are you guys willing to still try to fix it or not? He said, oh, I can ask that. She did that. All of them said, yeah, we want to fix it. And the next thing I told her to tell them is, I think I can help you. Would you like to have a conversation? <laughs> it was like that. It was like that simple, right? And <laughs> they all said, yes. She signed up. She signed up all of them. And then from there, she got referrals. And right. she went from making $2,000 on a good month to making $20,000 on a bad month. And that's the power of, you know, having a clear message and listening to people who don't just want to take the money away from you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Want you to actually succeed. Right. And also going back to your original message of being of service to people. You know, from, from, from my perspective, I mean, that's what we do. We're of service to people. Everybody that I've met who's come into our program with very few exceptions that's all they want to. They just have been sold this lie. You can't show your heart. This is business. You got to be a little detached. I'm like, why? People want to know you care. What is it? Maya Angelou, you know that poem she wrote, that, that, that line? People will forget what you said to them. People will forget what you did for them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Make yeah. people feel good. That's your job. Absolutely. So if people would like to work with you so that they can also make money on their passions and their service and you know what they are here to do, how what does that look like? Well, the first step is I've got um, a website called eCircleAcademy.com. I got a bunch of websites, but that's the best one. There's a number of free resources on that website. Um, and the second uh, step is once they've like, you know, taken all those free resources, they'll give them a whole bunch of things they can, you know, ingest on their own. They want to, if they want to have a conversation about 
where they're at, what it's going to take to take them from here to, you know, where they want to go. Then there's a, a link to like book a call like that. It's called ecircledacademy.com forward slash appointment. There's a little bit of a screening form. So we just want to make sure you're a serious business person. But as long as you fill out the screening form, the call's free. And, uh, you know, we'll go through and, and have a, a good look at where you're at and what, what you need to do differently than what you're currently doing. Excellent. I'll add all of those things and links into the show notes so people can Thank click you. on them really easily. Very kind of you, Whitney. You're awesome. Thank you. So I have a question that I like to ask to sort of wrap up the conversation. And that is, if your inner voice had a billboard, what would it say to the world? Believe in yourself and help others. Yeah, that works. Well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing all of your wisdom and your story. Thanks for having me on the show. I mean, you know, you're a great host. And this was a wonderful opportunity to have a beautiful, you know, authentic conversation. And I, um, I trust and hope that you and the people listening got something you can use in your life so you can win. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you're listening and you like what you hear, please consider subscribing and rating this podcast as it really helps get this podcast out to other people who might be interested in hearing it but don't know about it yet. And also, if you'd like to contact me or reach me, you can reach me at unconditioningpodcast at gmail.com or unconditioningpodcast on Instagram. Thank you so much. And until next time... Stay tuned in to you.